what food would they absolutely need to have at the dinner party? So dinner party for themselves, you said. Or for, for them, for, for like, for the group. Let's say they were throwing the a dinner party for the but, Rangers and somebody else was like, they were donating the money so they could just go out and buy whatever food they want. Okay. Um, uh, as a general fallback to uh, my favorite uh, kind of desserty sweet in sometime and oftentimes uh, breakfast indulgence, uh, cinnamon rolls. Freaking love me some cinnamon rolls. A dinner party of nothing but different types of cinnamon rolls, or just one type of cinnamon rolls. <laughs> well, I was thinking more like cinnamon a pop- roll party. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Why not? The cinnamon roll party. I kind of love that. What made you want to respond? Uh, to a casting call for a Power Ranger game. Not too long ago, me and my wife uh, visited a very good friend over in Seattle. And while we were there, outside of his room on this little shelf was the Power Rangers book. And I was like, hey, that looks kind of interesting. He's like, oh yeah, I I just, he backed it. He got the book and everything. And that was essentially his um, to-do pile of reading, right? Was that that little shelf. And it was the top of the shelf. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, So that kind of put it on my radar when I saw you post about it. I was like, oh, hey, this will be an opportunity to, to be able to kind of dive into this and uh, be able to familiarize myself with what they've done. Um, because when it really comes down to it, I'm not nearly as much um, of a uh, Power Rangers nerd as yourself or some of the other players. Hello, one and all. I'm John McDonald, aka Zordon, and I'm here again with one of my uh, Rangers for the Becoming Mighty and Morphin interviews. Uh, this is kind of getting to know the characters and some of the process and behind the scenes before the premiere of the Becoming Mighty and Morphin podcast, hopefully coming in early 2023 to the Rem Alternus Alternia archives, available wherever fine podcasts are sold. Today I am with Patrick Bryant, a.k.a. Jester, a.k.a. Eddie Batch. Uh, hello, uh, Jester. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hello. My name is Patrick Brent, as you said. I also go by Jester, as you said. And I play Eddie Thatch, as uh, he also said. So I um, bumped into the Rem Alternance crew uh, through um, like-minded individuals, uh, individuals that uh, have also created um, Fragment Unicorn Games. I primarily do stuff with Dragon Unicorn Games. I do a very, very little bit of minor writing for Shadowrun missions. I love how modest you are. Like writing a Shadowrun mission module doesn't take all the energy. Well, um, I, I feel like I cheat a little bit because when it comes to the modules and everything, um, I have a partner that helps me write. So whenever we sit down to do those modules, it's, it's me and him. And it's a cooperative, collaborative type thing. So I'm never really taking the whole thing on my own shoulders at any given time. I mean, if you're cheating, then Rogers and Hammerstein were cheating. And so was Stephen Sondheim. That's not cheating. That's just, we're all that's, just an, that's an old, old art form, really, of collaboration and creation. So I don't yeah. think it's cheating. And plus, you do a lot of collaboration um, because essentially what a tabletop role-playing game is is essentially cooperative narrative storytelling because i kind of create the scaffolding but i don't write full scripts i create a scaffolding and the characters do what they will you created eddie thatch uh if you could describe eddie in three sentences or less how would you describe eddie um awkward affable uh good intending um there's at least in the intended kind of setup there's a layer of kind of like like tragic self experiences but um he tries very hard to not let that affect how he views other people so a tragic self experiences is, is that something you're hoping to bring more into the character as we continue in the process or is that just like private background flavor text for you and if someone figures that out great but otherwise it just kind of colors how you 
approach things? It, it's primarily um, it could essentially kind of uh, color how I approach things, or at least give me a little bit of um, mental backdrop as to why I may make a decision in the way I do. Um, as far as whether or not it becomes uh, spotlighted, um, I have I have personally have no issues with that. It's just it, right now it's kind of just like soft points in my mind. Um, I'm pulling a great deal for some of it from my own personal experiences when I lost my father. So I was thinking about similar aspects for um, Eddie's background with that. Cause like right now he's not living with his direct family. Right. So you've, you yourself kind of picked up on that a little bit with uh, that kind of that awkward interaction that I had with um, um, Kim, uh, who's the character that is basically inspired by my um, mother-in-law. So the little things like that, I'm borrowing a lot from what I've experienced because in all honesty, if I haven't experienced it, I don't really feel that I have a place in really trying to portray it. What was the character creation process like for you? Did you find it really easy uh, to build from that? Was that something that came later? How was creating Eddie for you? Um, creating Eddie for me uh, like felt, felt easy. The system uh, is not very complicated. It, it's a uh, it's got a little bit of a crunch to it, but when it really comes down to it, a couple things were very primary in my head. And one was um, I generally will play kind of, at least historically, a little bit more of an insular intellectual type. Like I, I'd be the odd mage or something like that. And so recently I've been very much wanting to try to force myself to play more of a social face character. And with Eddie, um, so with Eddie, I have like the socials real high and then like his body is real high, but like dexterity is low and smarts are pretty low as well. So I, um, the baseline was just, I, I want him to, I want to be part of the conversation, but as far as the other aspects of it goes, I kind of want to be this like tinky anchor of a character and not okay. necessarily the spotlight, you know, I, I'd rather kind of be a little bit more supporting. So that's kind of the hope. Okay. Uh, so for people that don't know TCRPGs very well, which is part of what the Alternia Archives does, is trying to teach people about what TCRPG is and what terminology is, especially outside of, quote unquote, the big three. Uh, what is crunch? How would you explain that to a person? If so um, crunch would be the technical rules, the, the math, the, the guidelines, uh, all those little things are on it. So in a game like shadow run where you have to keep a lot of uh, dice numbers in your head even if you got the sheet in front of you you feel like shadow run would have a lot of crunch for instance. Uh, shadow run is a perfect example of a very high level of crunch and and so the power ranger rpg on a scale of like extra crunchy peanut butter to super creamy peanut butter where would it land for you in that kind of crunch aspect yeah, it's got like one or two nuts okay one or two nuts it's just enough, and the rest of it is sugar, just as peanut butter should be. When I interviewed Jane, she talked about being a little nervous about wanting to be in the in a, uh, in the RPG because she didn't feel like she had as much ranger experience. Uh, do you do you feel like you have that nervous energy too? Um. Yes and no. So I don't have the experience and everything that would be applicable to like universe or the um, references, the referential information or that underlying context. But like the, as far as core values go, um, the core values that I feel that are really espoused in a game like this, um, I, I feel that it's basically like 100% on board. And that, that's the kind of thing I really love about it. It's like, it, it's been rather memefied that whole like friends you made along the way kind of thing or the power of friendship kind of stuff. But Heck, that that's the kind of stuff that gets me going. So I like that. So you've been playing Eddie for a while now. We're actually uh, recording episodes currently, and we've gotten about halfway through the season, more or less. Um, is there anything that has surprised you, like a reaction to something Eddie, Eddie had or something you brought in that you just kind of brought in on the cuff and it worked out really well? What surprised you as you played? Hmm. Uh, I don't really feel that anything has really like surprised me so much as I've been really grateful for the responses I received for some of the um, 
silliness that I've kind of done with the character, right? So it's like, um, you can get to a certain point when you're trying to play kind of a more comedic type thing where you're just kind of being annoying or you're, you're not really adding to the situation. And I'm trying to avoid that. And uh, so when I would do something like refer to Zordon as fish tank bro or something like that, that to me feels like it's been um, accepted rather nicely because it might spur like a sentence or two of conversation. Like, what do you mean? It's like, Oh yeah, you know this. And then, and then it's done. I'm fine. I'm not, we don't sit there and um, dwell on his silly um, aspect of uh, wanting to like give things nicknames. And then um, some of the other things, like when we were, we had that session, we were at the beach um, picking up, were we like picking up litter or is it basically just yeah it was angel grove's annual recycling day hashtag yeah. get the kids out of that get the teens out of the house for a summer day <laughs> and, and so and so i just kind of off the cuff made up well uh, eddie's gonna be out there but he's he, he's gotta do something silly about it right so he's got one of those t-rex things at the end of one of those grab alarms right and then when um i believe it was jane's character came over and since her uh do we not want to reveal any of those aspects? Would that be spoilers? Um, I don't think it's spoilers because you and Jane especially were both in the streamathon as your respective characters. So it's not yeah. really spoilers at this point. Hashtag so, watch the streamathon <laughs> episodes on YouTube if you don't know what we're talking about. And watch yeah, so, so basically, it was just generally off the cuff, I just kind of like, I thought Dino, like little T-Rex type thing. And so she came over and I was like, wait, this is her sword. So I was like, um, so at that moment, uh, as part of that little thing where um, I kind of want Eddie to be a person that kind of thinks about others a little bit more than he might think about himself. Uh, he, I then wrote it off as like, oh, no, this is for you. And then Eddie pulls out one that's a black Mastodon little thing for himself. So basically kind of like either he found them or he made them, but some some little nerdy thing. And um, Jane's reaction for that thing was was rather nice. You know, where, um, she seemed to rather... Uh, um, kind of like grateful for the interaction on it kind of thing. I thought that was a really nice little moment. Yeah. Uh, so Eddie's kind of disability to be social and comedic, uh, do you find that what, what that's what makes him unique among the Rangers in this cast? Because traditionally, like when you think of the Black Ranger, you think of the dance keto um, thing that Zach made up essentially, which became kind of not as big a thing as some other things, but it was its own thing. So, like, do you think that comedy, that social aspect, is what makes Eddie unique among his fellow Rangers? Or why why did the black spectrum, black slash purple spectrum, pick Eddie, do you think? Um, as far as why the black spectrum picked Eddie, I don't know, Zervan. How about you tell me? But um, when it comes down to the characterization and everything, I'm not really focused too much personally on the, the color aspect of it. Um, personally, it's basically, I, I just wanna be able to try to play what Eddie is in my head. And so whether or not the direction I've taken really kind of fits um, what some individuals may or may not view as a Black Ranger really just kind of comes down to how accurate your assignments were, right? And so, with the limited exposure to Power Ranger um, media that I have, I'll be very honest. I've never really paid much attention to the Black Ranger or like the Yellow Ranger or the Pink Ranger. Um, primarily as a youth, I kind of identified a little bit with the Blue Ranger and then the whole like Green Ranger, White Ranger thing was really kind of what I paid attention to. Like I really didn't care about Heck, it was really just like a little bit of Blue Ranger and then Green Ranger is when I paid attention to. So when it really comes down to what the what that little bit of core canon exposure to what these aspects may may not kind of mean or generate from, I really don't have a good reference experience okay. for reference. Uh, I, I will say in session zero, the first episode, um, I do dive a bit into it, but it's always good at the point of rat to be able to recap and say, do you feel like Zordon made the right choice or do you wish you had a different color, quote unquote? I feel I, that is one thing that I personally feel that uh, you deserve a lot of kudos for. I really feel like you've made some really good decisions. 
But interestingly, Black Rangers do tend to be, in the book especially, they are more social. They are more about a charm aspect to them. Um, I really like what you've added to this character and you've kind of added this fun mythology that we haven't really gotten to explore uh, where you were very specific about the type of axe that you built when you got a power axe, um, which is not something you originally have. Um, in the in the book, one of the changes that I made as the GM is I didn't give you a power weapon right away because in the Sentai original series, they actually didn't have power weapons until about episode five or six and they had to go on a journey to get them. And the journey was important to me. Um, and when you finally got an ax, it has two settings, but you don't use your energy setting much. The energy cannon no. is really more for you. It's more about the ax portion of it. And especially having it be specifically like a ye old Elden ring ax, uh, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting thing. Cause it's part of your character. You haven't really gotten to meet a lot of yet. Cause you've done a lot of the social thing. So I like uh, that. Uh, another small note on that one. So um, for those watching the, um, the L the axe the specific axe of inspiration. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I'll pull it up uh, when I'm not uh, directly talking. But it's it's like a damaged axe. the The shaft is bent. There's notches out of spots and everything. But when it really comes, so it it looks essentially um, like something that doesn't really have a whole lot of like function or merit to it but the scaling with if you know anything about um souls board games or anything um is really high towards that stream it's one of if memory serves it's one of the higher scaling um axes for strength so it's honestly pretty darn effective as a weapon and it just looks really unique yeah and uh you are going to get a chance to upgrade it uh one of the mechanics of the game is being able to upgrade your power weapon to this legendary status. The idea is that as you become more prolific as a ranger, you build up this kind of legendary arsenal that is distinctly yours. So as a black ranger, it's Eddie's black ranger power axe, uh, which is really cool. And I'm really excited to see what you add onto it. Everyone has to, uh, everyone has to roll. So it's up to the fates a little bit as to how long it takes to build and when but everybody does get a chance to kind of upgrade and personalize who the ranger is and how they affect the universe. Um, and speaking of the universe, we are in the very classic setting known as Angel Grove. Is there anywhere in Angel Grove that you haven't gotten to take Eddie that you'd like to explore um, in kind of the back half of this first season? This uh, comes down to a lack of familiarity with the setting. Um, there isn't. So uh, the primary portion of any memory that I have would just be them in school or them out in some nondescript outdoor set. Um, other than that, there's not anything that really chimes in like a memory or an association for me. Well, I basically, this city is a bit like The Sims. Like I have locations, but there's a lot open to interpretation. So like if there was something eddie wanted to do or go do like if for some reason the axe during craze hit angel grove or something like that or if there's like an underground magician society or something is there anything about angel grove that eddie would like to explore in this vast city on the edge of doom um the only thing i can immediately think of is and this is one thing kind of had in the back of my head for what um eddie might be about is um, we had a, a brief scene where he asked me to uh, describe his bedroom. And one of the aspects of it I had is he had a lot of like posters or artwork that were still just not set up, but they were still just like in their tubes or whatever. And what I was thinking about that is like, I personally um, have uh, found myself when I go to conventions or anything, I'm less likely to buy like a, um, games or like whatever, but I found myself leaning a lot more towards um, supporting um, creative folk and buying their arts and doing this kind of stuff. So that was a little bit of a, a key into my own personal habits that I rather enjoyed. So for the sake of Eddie, it would be um, coming across either a like a, a nerd convention or something like that, or maybe even just kind of like a, um, a, a farmer's market that has a, a few things like that where um, uh, he'll have a chance to really kind of 
have the ability to provide that support, um, a little bit more of a financial sense to um, folks that do art and um, things of that nature. So we're going to head right into talking about uh, the system itself. Uh, so Essence 20 is a system that is not part of the big three of D&D, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrunner, Savage Worlds. Overall, how does Essence 20 compare to those other systems for you? It seems rather, it seems very straightforward. If you're familiar with D20, this is essentially D20 with just like a few things. Well, actually, so if you're familiar with D20 and you're familiar with White Wolf, dot systems and kind of the way it lays out the different categories of stats this to me feels like a, a merge of those concepts to a degree okay uh so for someone that doesn't have um uh, for someone that doesn't have a lot of experience with d20 but say they, they pick up the book because of nostalgia uh, what would you say is the kind of easiest thing in entering the system and what's the most difficult what was the hardest for you to wrap your, what was the easiest to wrap your brain around? What was the most difficult? Um, I, I'm not really confident I've encountered something so far that's been um, necessarily uh, something I'd tag as difficult to wrap my head around for um, uh, the system. Um, for the sake of what's easy, uh, I want to do a thing. Okay, roll a d20. Uh, that, that's really the easiest baseline that you have on that. Um, the, the system, uh, forgive me, what's it, what's it called? I want to stop for doing, referring to it in just a, a generic fashion. That's fine. You can call it the system if you want. That's fine. It's the essence 20 system essence. is what it's called. So with the essence 20 system, um, when you invest in your basic attribute, like how strong you are, how smart you might be, um, things like that, um, it's done to, essentially as a kind of a culmination of the skills associated with that core attribute. So if I want to represent my character's ability to um, be diplomatic, that would, that in itself contributes to how social the character would be. But when I go to be diplomatic in a situation and I roll my D20, um, the magnitude of my diplomacy repre is represented by an additional die that I get to roll that will be of a varying value, um, starting at nothing for the bonus to like a D2, or just like a coin flip, uh, D4, 1 to 4, 1 to 6, 1 to 8, etc., um, moving on through. So that aspect is a, is a definite kind of pull away from the baseline of D&D, or a D20 outside of a kind of analogy of like, if you had a bard in your group. So right now it kind of feels like you're we're a little bit like we're playing D&D &D and there's always a bard around. That's because we like bards at Rem Alternus. We are predisposed, generally speaking, to bards. Uh, and what you're talking about is the idea of you have a skill, which is a skill check, which is what will have your role. And if you don't have a specialty, you just roll a D20 straight which is kind of nice for roll 20 when your character sheets break. If you don't have a specialty, then you can, uh, then you can just roll the D20 and the advanced dice roller. But the idea is you get these points and then I, I actually make you do this in the book. It's not clear if you have to do this, but then I have you put points and things and you get specialties. So it's another further way to customize your character um, that I think is really useful, especially if you're, trying to figure out a little bit of who your character is because the specializations kind of force you to say, I really want this. I have to hit this target. So I've got 12 points to spread out. I got to spread them out somehow. Um, and it, help, it really helps build a character, I feel like. So. Um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but uh, the, so it's scripted what the core attributes are. And so they're on the character sheet and so are the general skill categories. But when it comes down to specializations, that's, that's a grab bag, right? That's something that you choose. And the book might give uh, examples, but yeah. so, I believe it was just kind of like, well, what do you want it to be? Wasn't it? Generally speaking, there are certain attributes that exist, uh, certain specializations that exist with certain skill checks. So like persuasion involves diplomacy, truth, and three other things. I'm getting it off the top of my head. But for, right. something, for something like a science, if you want to take a specialization, then you have to take one of the ologies and that is open to interpretation. So like um, 
a specialization someone in medicine has in science might not be medicine. They might have taken that in survival. Uh, so they get the cartography skill or something like that. But then they could have a biology science skill, uh, which means that if they're rolling a science check, but it's not biology related, I may not give them specialization. I generally do because I want people to succeed. Uh, but if I'm feeling particularly mean or antsy that day, I'd be like, what is your specialization? And I could say, no, just roll your flat D20. Uh, that's not really type of GM I want to be because I think it's more interesting in the game uh, to do like an improv, say yes and type deal. So, so let's say that in the season finale, Zordon is not revealed to just be a dude in a fish tank that gives you awesome dinosaur theme powers. But Zordon is actually a genie and will grant your character three wishes. What would Eddie wish for? Um, his father was still alive. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, I, I, I do have a, a second one in mind, but I'm blanking on the names of the characters. So, so I'll get back to that in just a second. And then... Um, the, the third one would kind of be a little bit of a, um, uh, not a skirt, whatever. Uh, just everyone be kinder to each other. And so then, um, for back to the second one, um, there's the two characters in the Power Rangers who've had a long, long history with the um, franchise itself, too. Um, you have the chubbier bully and you have the thinner bully. The thinner bully's name is Skull, and I can't remember the uh, chubbier bully. A bulk is his name, bulk. but he's called Bulk. Because his last name is Bulkmeyer. Yep, so he yep. may have chosen Bulk himself. It's hard to say. But Bulk yes. and Color, yes. There's but a um, Eddie's a wish, bags. Eddie's wish, honestly, would um, uh, be to uh, kind of um, uh, like in, my, in the back of my head, Eddie kind of feels bad for Bulk and the way that he um, goes about his life and the way that he kind of reacts to situations and his confrontations. Because um, I don't, uh, Eddie doesn't really feel like he's a bad person in any degree, but that um, Bulk just kind of doesn't know a good, healthy way to deal with those situations. And so a large portion of that would probably be like, um, uh, maybe it be as a kind of, uh, just to say it like the, the Bulk's friend. Okay. I'm totally not taking notes about that at all, by the oh, way. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see any keyboard motions. Totally no, not no, taking I didn't see notes any keyboard at all. Motions. So do you have a favorite memory or challenge? Uh, you can spoil things a little bit. Uh, you can be also as evasive as you want to be. Like, when you think about the game thus far, do you have a favorite uh, memory besi uh, besides giving Jane the, the grabber on the beach, I suppose? Uh, specific to the podcast, or could we include the stream of thumbs? Uh, you can include the stream of thons, yeah. So um, in the Better Than Customer Service, I believe was the name of it. Yes, the, your um, summer job, the summer job challenge, the first one earlier in the day when we were all very awake and we're not living on caffeine yet. Um, the, the biggest challenge with that one, because we had um, Jane, Jane, Jane's character and, um, or it should have Isabeth's character, Jane, and my character, Eddie, were the two established rangers and then we had um a few other well, three other individuals who were new to the gig so the challenge of that is kind of like getting them into it and trying to kind of like hey lead them um hopefully in a little bit more of a natural aspect of the, the conflict involved in this like that and um so i feel like i kind of accidentally ended up becoming this kind of like cheerleader leader kind of thing where it's like um but i i didn't want to be very direct with it so i, I was saying so i was like no nah, just believe in yourself and, <laughs> and things like that and well that's very much the kind of vibe that you've been rolling into it i totally didn't take any notes about you doing that that may come up later not oh, in crap. any way shape oh. or form <laughs> well, well to be I fair to be fair i actually really kind of enjoyed um, the little interaction we got out of that yeah, it was really good. You can essentially build any ranger you want. When they made Bulk and Skull into temporary rangers, for instance, they were like the Warthog and the Meerkat. They were basically Timon and Pumbaa characters, essentially. And so it's really 
and I talked about this with Jane, is one thing I didn't get to explore because we ran out of time um, in the scholarship episode was the idea of the shadow version of who your characters are, uh, which is something that interests me as a writer, is the idea of, yes, Eddie is a comedian, but what's the other side of that coin? What happens when comedy gets in the way of what we're supposed to do? Or what happens when you're using your comedy to distract because it's a competition? And or, it, or you're being insulting. Yeah, there was supposed to be, there was a whole portion of that episode where if we had run out of time, essentially, we would have had a conversation with Zordon talking about competition and shadow self. 